All right. Well, thank you. Um, thanks all for being here and welcome. Um, I, my name is Greg Pliska from the great class of 84. Um, <laughs> Uh, I am told that I should also remind you to be aware of where the fire exits are. Uh, of course, I don't know the answer to that, but I assume they are, I assume they are the green signs that say exit on them. Um, traditionally, we ask everyone to silence their devices as well. Um, I, this, this panel is not about me at all. I will introduce myself very briefly. For the, those of you who don't know me, I'm a composer, orchestrator, puzzle maker. Um, and uh, which puts me in a, what is what would traditionally be described as one of the cr uh, creative arts, one of the creative careers. And so we titled this, this panel Creative Spirits. Somebody yesterday accused me of the panel being cool people from my class who I wanted to talk to. <laughs> uh, and that would not be a lie. But really the goal was to, to look at creativity and cre creative careers and creative work, uh, both within that traditional sphere of the arts, but also beyond it. And, and what does creativity mean in a wider spectrum of, uh, of, of work uh, and, and action in the world, both creative, you know, the act of creating something and the also the act of taking creative action to make a change. Now, this is not a class. You're not being graded. Um, but I did, I did bring a, a, an excellent book by Scott Barry Kaufman and Carolyn Gregoire called Wired to Create, which is a, they've kind of looked at a bunch of neuroscience studies about what goes on in the, what they call the messy mind of a creative person. Um, and there are a couple things I wanted to mention from this book before I introduce the panelists and start chatting with them about their work. Um, one of them is uh, actually, a very traditional model of the creative process, which the book itself tries to go beyond. It kind of starts with, here's how we've thought about the creative process, and here's how it's messier than that. But I do think this as a, a kind of outline of, of a creative process is really useful. And the, the four stages in this model of creativity are preparation, during which a creator uh, acquires as much information as possible about a problem, Incubation, during which the creator lets the knowledge stew in the unconscious mind, uh, what Einstein referred to as com combinatory play. Illumination, during which the insight arises in consciousness. Uh, and then verification, where the creator fleshes out the insights and then communicates that to others. Um, and I think that fourth step is, is so crucial. Uh, to the creative process, the idea that not only do we come up with ideas, but we then verify them, both for ourselves. Is this actually the thing I meant to create? Does this thing do what I meant for it to do? And do the people I want to use this to communicate to, or to, to you know, to the problem I want to solve, does it actually do that thing? And that's a constant feedback loop. And in fact, that fourth step of verification is gathering more data, which then goes back into incubation and illumination and around again. Um, the other thing that's in that um, uh, Scott and Carolyn have in this book that's, I think, really terrific are um, looking at three personality factors that are directly correlated to creativity. One of which is plasticity, right? The, uh, the ability to explore and engage with novel ideas, objects, and scenarios. That sounds like fairly traditionally how we think of creative artists as having that ability. Um, divergence, um, actually I should read from the book what they say about divergence because it's, it's, um, it's interesting the way they put it. Um, divergence reflects a nonconformist mindset and independent thinking and is related to impulsivity and lower levels of agreeableness and conscientiousness. <laughs> And I, my wife can vouch for some of that. Um, but it is, I think, it, I think this is you know, uh, uh, an accurate description of part of what create, makes people creative, is that divergence and uh, nonconformist spirit. But then the third aspect that they see in, in many creative people, common to creative people, is convergence. The ability to conform, put in the hard effort necessary to exercise practicality and make ideals, I, ideas tenable. Convergence consists of high conscientiousness, precision, persistence, critical sense, and sensitivity to the audience. 
So taken together, these qualities encourage the development and expression of creativity. So I think I just as a kind of frame for what we're going to talk about, I think some of that is interesting. And I, I think each of my classmates here wrestles with some of that creative process and, and has those creative traits, uh, personality traits. So let me introduce these three folks. Uh, and then we'll kind of go through and let, uh, let each of them talk about um, their work and what they've been involved in that we think gives this, this framework to what we're calling creative spirits. Um, starting on my left, Mara Boone has worked across finance, technology, and nonprofit sectors starting at Morgan Stanley after Williams, and then from Australia where she has lived for the past 34 years. Mara currently is a company director and board chair in sustainable finance, climate technology, regenerative agriculture, and nature restoration companies. She chairs the board of a classical music ensemble that celebrates nature, producing an album of endangered bird calls named Songs of Disappearance that beat Taylor Swift in the Australian music charts. So, Mara B. Not lost on many of you, of course, is the fact that a swift is also a kind of bird. <laughs> Not relevant, but couldn't, st couldn't stop from talking about that. Next to Mara, Diana Kellogg, who received a Master of Architecture from Columbia University in 1990 and a BA from Williams in 1984. Kellogg established her own firm, Diana Kellogg Architects, in 1992 and won critical acclaim for her work on the Gyan, Gyan, or G-Y-A-A-N? Gyan uh, Center in uh, Jai Somar in Rajasthan, India. Most recently, Kellogg launched her nonprofit Tara for Change, dedicated to enhancing, enhancing the global cultural landscape by providing essential support to arts, cultural institutions, schools, and nonprofit organizations through innovative architectural and design program. Diana Kellogg. And on, the, on your far right, Ken Wyatt who has been the co-founder of 44 North Vodka and the brand's distillery, Idaho Mercantile, Idaho Mercantile Distiller, since 2003. He is a beverage industry lifer, having worked on varied brands and including Pepsi-Cola, Remy Martin, Cognac Hennessy, and Stella Artois. Ken finds the drinks business very appealing. <laughs> the drinks business, the drinks, the drinks business very appealing, as it offers a blend of finance, sales, marketing, people, and travel that makes every day unique and exciting. When not selling bottles of the company's signature Mountain Huckleberry Vodka, he enjoys the slopes of Idaho's famous Sun Valley Ski Resort or hiking in the Pacific Northwest with camera in tow, pursuing a lifelong passion for photography. He is the proud father of James Bates, class of 16, and Caroline Williams, class of 18, Ken Wyatt. So you can see where we came up with the title Creative Spirits. Um, Ken was, was uh, we were very lucky to have some of Ken's uh, vodka actually at our dinner last night. Are we having it again tonight? Okay, good, very good. Um, so thank you for doing that. Ken, why don't we start with you? Tell us a little bit about 44 North and where it came from. I'll be taking uh, orders later, <laughs> so just to give you guys a little bit of a glimpse into you know, what it's like for me, you know, I travel around and visit distributors all throughout the country and present the brand, right? So you're gonna get a little bit of that brand presentation. I'll make it really quick. I wasn't kidding about taking orders though. <laughs> so anyway, this is a little bit of a company overview. So we talked to people, why 44 North? Well, in our business, you have a lot of different product categories, different price points. So for us, we want to tell people that this is a brand, our distributors and our retailers is a brand you'll make money on because the margin, right, is very much in the premium end of the business. You know, there's the $9 bottle of vodka, but why sell that when you can sell a $30 bottle, right? And that's kind of the price range that we're hitting. So it's about telling our distributors why you want to carry this product. So you'll make money, super premium, it's local, and as Greg mentioned, I was in the wine business for Remy. I ran their wine portfolio. So I basically, in developing this brand, took a lot of the things I learned in the wine business. So, you know, about the land and the environment that you make the wine, and basically kind of graphed that into the vodka space, which really hadn't been done before. Um, you know, people talked about vodka from Russia, but 
not a vodka from a particular landscape. So everything that we do at 44 North kind of riffs on the Idaho agricultural tradition. And if you ever drive through Idaho, you'll just be amazed, not just by, amazed not just by the natural beauty, but just the, the farming environment. So Idaho grows potatoes, obviously, which are in the vodka, but there's wheat, there's corn, huckleberries are the state fruit, also in our vodka, um, nectarines, cherries. So you've got just a, probably one of the most diverse agricultural traditions in the country, and that's something that we tap into with 44 North. And when we're talking to a new distributor, we say, hey, we have success in Florida, New York, Arizona, California, Illinois, and Wisconsin. Well, in Wisconsin, if you know Wisconsin at all, all drinks are successful in Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> Wisconsin over indexes. Let's just, that's what we say in the industry. Um, so I'm showing you this slide, just to show a little bit of the team here. Um, but I want to emphasize just the last person at the bottom of the slide. Does anyone recognize that name? OK, that's Ken Hillman, class of 85. He's involved with the company, works, uh, lives in Illinois, but works for us and manages our, our chain business. So I have a business partner, Ron Zier. He's actually a Holy Cross guy, class of 82. Um, but really, I just wanted to point him out and Ken, because I told him I was going to give him a shout out today. <laughs> um, this is the distillery itself. We have two stills. So that's a pot still on that side. That's what we start with. And that's a column still. And that's where we kind of finish the product and really pull out the stuff that makes vodka burn. Um, you know, methanol, things like that come out in that part of the process. And that's our building in Shelley, Idaho, um, which is a town of 60% LDS people. And a big part of our hourly workforce are actually uh, women who live in the community and come in on bottling days and do their shift, and it works out really well for them. But America's a unique country. I always tell people that only in America well, you have an African-American black guy like myself with people from the Mormon community making vodka for them. But <laughs> America's a great country. <laughs> Love America. Um, so this is a display of our Huckleberry Lemonade kind of prepared cocktail. That's one of our relatively new products. That's an Albertson store in Safeway. So in Idaho, because of the liquor rules, we're able to sell stuff below 13% in grocery stores. That's 12.5%. <laughs> and the high proof stuff is sold in state liquor stores. So my two largest customers are the state of Idaho on the high spirit side. And on the lower alcohol side, it's the Albertsons slash Safeway. So we're with Albertsons in Idaho, but also California, Arizona, a bunch of other states. And luckily for me, Albertson Safeway is based in Boise, Idaho. We get a little bit of local love and also on the national basis from that. So that's a display. You'll see those in Boise, hopefully, if you're there over the summer. And then we added to that with some new products um, a couple of years ago, or actually last year. So we have in the middle one that looks like Mountain Dew. Once again, I'm borrowing from my Pepsi background, right? That's a lemon lime product. We call that Alpine Mist, Mountain Dew. You get it, right? Oh. And then. Um, I used to love Hawaiian punch as a kid. So basically, you have the mountain berry punch right there, which is Hawaiian punch, but from the mountains. Um, so in terms of creative process, for me, you know, I mentioned earlier how I took the, the wine knowledge. So I was responsible at one point for a property in Napa, which was a sparkling winery, um, Piper Sonoma. And I was also responsible for a brandy distillery in Carneros in, uh, in Napa. And so, you know, taking that wine knowledge, you know, understanding where the grapes come from and in the sparkling wine product, the uh, Russian River Valley in uh, Sonoma and just beautiful dirt. And eventually, like I said, grafted that into the spirit space. Um, but also, you know, my experience as a kid drinking Hawaiian punch and working for Pepsi, right? So for me, creativity, a lot of times, is just borrowing from different things, right? And people will say, you know, how do you come up with a brand? And, you know, one of the first things I think of is my Shakespeare class, hmm. right? Or 
you know, something I've read, you know, from Joseph Campbell. And for me, you know, there's this idea, well, Campbell's idea of the hero's journey, right? And how the, the, the brand is supposed to, at least I believe, kind of get you on that journey because we're the hero in our own journey. The brand is maybe the potion, at least in my case, or the thing that kind of fulfills that, um, that story. So I, I tell people, you know, all the time that for me, you know, branding is a liberal arts process. And having taken some economics and chemistry, well, obviously I'm applying the chemistry um, to this as well. But like I said, a lot of what, what we do in, you know, in our industry, it's not, a, um, it's not a new industry. There have been people putting things in bottles and putting them on boats in the Nile, right? You know, so it's been going on for, for centuries. Human beings have been doing these things. Um, so I tell people this business I'm in is uh, low tech but high touch because it's about people and getting out and communicating and meeting people and explaining what the brand's about. So anyway, these are just some of the marketing materials. It's like a necker you might see on it. These are some of the recipes you'll see on our um, website and social media. And I don't know if Nate in the back can run uh, one of the cocktail videos. Nate? This is something you'll see on our Instagram, at 44 North Vodka, please follow. <laughs> Always be selling. <laughs> so this was this year, that's the Dreamer and commemoration of Dr. King. A little Bob Marley, stand up for your rights in there. You get, you get that, right? So that was something we ran um, on our social media, like I said, in January, and there's some others as well. I forgot which um, holiday we're celebrating here. And I think there's one more. Yeah, I think there were three. That's New Year's Day. <laughs> 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 it's the day after drink. You, uh, yeah, so no dry January. <laughs> but relatively lighter on the alcohol, hopefully. Um, so that's kind of the brand in a nutshell, and hopefully I explained a little bit about you know the creative process, but with that I'll... Well, I actually think one of the things we talked about over email was uh, related to that thing I said at the introduction about the traditional creative process of incubation, or uh, of... Um, you know, data gathering and then incubating the idea, because we talked a little bit about how your career itself was the data gathering step, mm -hmm. right? Working in the drinks industry for so long, and then finally saying you want to make your own, sort of as the creative act now that you've gathered all this data. Um, but I also wondered, because we talked about this um, yesterday, I think, the, that as you set out to do this, Idaho wasn't the first destination. Right, and, and uh, you managed to talk, tell a little bit about that story because it speaks to the, also the creative act of, uh, we used to say when I used to teach, uh, do a lot of arts education, that one of the things the arts helps with is movable goals. The ability to say, well, I want to get to here, oh, but there's a block to that, so now I want to get there instead, right? That creative way of thinking to reach an outcome but have different ways of getting there. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Yeah, we, we call that a pivot, right? Yeah. Okay, and being an entrepreneur, you're always looking for pivot points because things come up, you've got to figure out a way to go around them. So originally, um, I was living in New Hampshire and there was an opportunity to buy a distillery in New Hampshire, but it, we ended up getting outbid by a much larger company that needed the excess capacity or needed a place to um, produce some products that were booming at the time. Does anyone remember um, Cabana Boy rum? With the cute guys on the bottle with the tray. So they needed a place to make that, so they bought this place in New Hampshire, and then all of a sudden we didn't have a place to, to work. And we, f we found a place in Idaho that was making great spirits, but they didn't know anything about the marketing process like we understood it. So we went to them and we contracted with them for a number of years before we built the place in, in Shelley. So just kind of went from New Hampshire to Idaho. I went back and forth for a number of years. 
and went full time in Idaho, you know, just about five years or so ago. But yeah, it was just an opportunity for us to, you know, put our plans into place, but just kind of pull up the New Hampshire roots and put the roots down in Idaho. Yeah. So instead of huckleberry, we might have had cranberry. Or, or maple, maple or, right, or, or exactly. something, right? So, yeah. And, and that's also part of the process from that liberal arts perspective because, you know, when we started thinking about Idaho, you know, I just, I always tell people whenever I have a problem, um, I go to the library. I did go once in a while, Robin, right? <laughs> so I say, I go to the library, and today the library's on your phone or on your computer, but I just started like researching Idaho and I found out that the huckleberry is the state fruit of Idaho. So boom, huckleberry vodka. And people always say like, how'd you figure that out? I'm talking like people in Idaho because they, they were there, right? Yeah. And we were the first to mix huckleberries and spirits. And now there's like 10 huckleberry vodkas, there's huckleberry beers, wine, all these things, but we were the first to kind of integrate it, you know, into the adult beverage category. Um, but sometimes from the outside, you see things differently and you see them if you're on the mm -hmm. inside, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, which again, would be another hallmark of that creative process, yeah. sort of getting outside, the divergence part of it, right? We're gonna, not, we're gonna be nonconformist and break the rules and you know, go over there and then bring that back to the audience and make sure it works. So. Yeah. What's next for 44 North or for you and this business? Yeah, um, we've got some new innovations. So I think, you know, the beverage business is dynamic. The barriers to entry are pretty low. You know, we're not making electric vehicles or rockets or anything like that, right? So, you know, anyone with, you know, a bottling line or a bottle and a liquid, you know, and they can drive it someplace, right? They can they can get into the business, right? I, I kind of exaggerate maybe a little bit, but <laughs> the the barriers to entry are relatively low, right? So you're you're constantly seeing new things emerging. The consumer's changing, so we have people drinking low alk, non alk, whiskey category, right, is growing, tequila's growing, vodka's still a big category, um, you know, convenience, people looking for things in cans, so continuing to innovate. So this year we're going to be coming out with, because it's Idaho, it'll be under 13%, but it'll be a Bloody Mary one liter bottle um, with our signature vodka, so that's coming out in the fall. Uh, we've got another big bottle flavor coming out, which will be cherry limeade. So, you know, keeping that pretty basic stuff. So just continuing to innovate on a personal level, right? This is my 40th reunion, so getting up there. And um, these days, I was telling someone I spent a lot more time with lawyers and accountants and private equity guys than I'd like. But hopefully in the next couple of years, something will figure out on that latter front and um, either exit entirely or you know find some young talent to come in and and take over it won't be my kids um, but uh, hopefully someone else great great cool well thank you ken for sharing all that yeah. glad to be here thanks and, and i think what we'll do as we go through chatting with each person at the end have a hopefully have a chance for questions for any and all of the folks up here um but i would love to move to diana to talk a little bit about your work um do you want to should we just show the video first and roll that so great so this i think will speak for itself really gorgeous uh a gorgeous building and, and a very meaningful building so let's go ahead and play that date It really was important to me to have the building very much of the desert and very much of Jai Samir. I wanted the building to reflect the moving sand dunes, the wind, the elements that you see in a desert building that's really all about the sky. During the course of being there, I felt very strongly about the craftsmanship and actually to promote the craftsmanship. And in order to do so, it felt to me that it was important to actually show the kinds of building techniques in a modern form. And also I wanted for the girls ultimately to feel very safe in the building. So a strong cultural element that actually shows up in the built form and architecture is the veiling of women. So there are these screens, what we have called the jolly walls, which I did a modern interpretation of them. 
to actually provide modesty as a way to be respectful to to their culture, but also enable um, the kinds of of a- activities that I think are really important for girls that you know again globally we skip over. Like for example, I created this play wall. And in front of it is a jolly wall. So it's essentially a modesty screen. Behind this wall, these girls can be free and they can run up and down the stairs and they can play. The jolly walls actually also increase the speed of wind and cool the temperature by um, a venturi effect. The sandstone itself has very strong thermal capacity. I also incorporated um, high ceilings so that the heat would rise. And in addition to that, there's transom windows at that height where the wind actually takes the heat out through the classrooms into the courtyard. These methods have actually managed to reduce the the heat in the classrooms to, you know, sometimes 20 degrees this Fahrenheit to 30 degrees cooler. We have solar power, which basically covers all of our electrical needs. We have a pump because we have a water harvesting system. And for that, I went to local sources. There are people who are experts in the ancient water harvesting techniques, which so many of which are actually no longer um, in use in India. And I think there's a whole trend to sort of go back to what those systems are. So we have um, the roof is is a collector and our courtyard is a collector of water. We collect during the monsoon and for the rest of the year, we're fine. When I started researching the ellipse, it's the shape of uh, femininity across many cultures, female strength, um, you know, it's an egg, it's a womb. When the girls first went in, they started actually playing in circles. The women often work in circles. There's just a a natural connection from the shape. In Jaisamir, unfortunately, because of the caste system and the dowry system, there is a, a fairly high rate of, of female infanticide. There's um, very low literacy rates, and that's primarily because of child marriage and also um, the the girls are very much part of the labor force. It's really out of survival that they've that these conditions have happened. I don't propose to make all of these changes. What I wanted to do really with the school was to say, I'm going to create a space that actually elevates and honors the girl child and to serve as an example that, you know, your boys are valuable, but so are your girls. I I just think that's such a remarkable building. Do you want to talk a little bit about the journey to getting to that? Let's just say the journey uh, from graduation to there, or wherever we want to start with our journey, um, was um, not direct, not planned, and certainly had a lot to do with sort of serendipity and kind of um, following opportunities that came about. So I had run, um, all right, for uh, many years, 20 years, you know, relatively successful um, architecture firm where we did what most New York architects do, which is high-end residential and buildings and projects in the, you know, neighboring states. Um, I had done that for so long, and I actually had sort of reached just an actual, like, dead end, and I just couldn't, almost couldn't, um, couldn't imagine doing yet another kitchen and bathroom. And um, 
as much as I love them, but it's just like, I could do them in my sleep. So I was just like, I need to challenge myself. I need to go to some other place. Um, just, I didn't know what it was. Um, and I, through a whole series of events, happened to meet somebody who was doing this work, had a very good nonprofit um, working in India and Nepal. And I just said, hey, you know, do you need an architect for your school? And he said, yes. And I said, great. And then um, I became very, very good friends with him. And about two or three weeks later, it was my uh, daughter's break from, from uh, school. My husband and my son were both traveling someplace else. And I was, I was like, Clara, should we go to India? And she said, sure. She was like 12 at the time. And kind of that's where the journey began. Um, I um, fell in love with India as an architect, as a designer. It's sort of hard not to be kind of besotted by all the different sights, sounds, colors, motion, movement, um, textures there. So um, I embarked upon this building in the desert. I had actually no help whatsoever. I had one person working for me in my New York office, no one in India. It was nonprofit. We, you know, we had no money. So, um, yeah, I started out and um, <laughs> it was, um, it somehow got finished. But um, uh, it was a very, very, very long and arduous um, um, journey. Um, first, partially because of uh, the various approvals. Um, we, we had a land that was given to us that had no road access, um, which is, you know, you need road access to build your building. So that was kind of one, <laughs> number one. Um, we needed water, so that was number two. So we had to sort of figure out all of these things. Um, and then I just, you know, spent a lot of time, I mean, some of it was just, you know, came came about naturally, but, you know, what was important and why was I there doing this? Um, and, um, you know, what was important to me? And I had, by this time, I had spent a fair enough amount of time going back and forth, actually trying to find land. I'd gotten to know a lot of the people in the community, um, and liked them very much. The the whole um, uh, the the um, connection to land, which I feel here in the U.S. in many places we've really lost. They they have not. I mean, you know, their days are incredibly um, just driven by by weather, whether you know in in, in good good and bad ways. But a sandstorm and a monsoon are are. Um, things I learned about, which are really um, not things to um, take lightly. So um, I wanted to also focus on the heritage ar architecture, because I just thought it was incredibly fascinating as an architect to see carved stone um, and to have the opportunity to work with these craftsmen who could carve this stone was just nothing short of a um, of a miracle and just so uh, for for an architect in the US I mean you can't find anyone it's hard to find people who can build like good stone walls let alone carve them into incredible shapes so um, and then the other thing was is I learned a lot from them all about sustainability just because their resources are so scarce um, and I also knew because the budget was so small and to actually um, to manage the the building, I had to be very mindful of of cost. So basically, every dollar spent on the building was a dollar taken away from the girls. So we actually built the building for two hundred and twenty U.S. dollars. Um, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's unbelievable. I like your response. No, I mean, <laughs> that's like not even the cost of one of the toilets in the high rises. <laughs> I mean, that just. I don't know if it's good or bad, but that's that's sure. that's what it is. Um, 
And then uh, more than that, I wanted to make the space because like I said, I'd gotten to know some of the families and the kids. I wanted them to have a space that was uplifting, that they felt special, ennobled, and free, really free to be able to explore and learn because that's a very difficult problem in India. Actually, a lot of these girls never leave their homes at all. Um, and you know, it's interesting because I actually found somebody to do an athletic program with them and she said these girls, you know, they lack basic balance, they lack a lot of sort of very fundamental things simply because they have never left the indoors of their house. So um, it's led to many, many other projects. Um, I got I can't tell you how many awards and accolades I've gotten. I've gotten a Aga Khan nomination, a couple of AIA awards, all of this stuff, which is just to me funny because I was building this building in the middle of nowhere and I never thought anyone would even see it, let alone have this kind of response that we've had. Um, and it's led to projects, um, should I keep talking? You can, you, you're, <laughs> you're certainly, well, no, I was, I mean, you're, you're answering all, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're answering all the questions I was going to ask about sort of where this is, you know, oh. where this has led you next. So I, talk about what's coming next, okay. please. What's coming next is unknown. I have to say one of the things I like about what I've been doing and probably what I've been doing my whole life is like, if I knew how something was going to end, then like really why bother doing it? So um, I am in the midst of doing a dinosaur museum and climate center in Mongolia, where we visited and it was just fascinating. Um, and also a luxury housing spa with a community give back portion in Morocco, um, a school and orphanage in Zimbabwe. Um, and I get offers all the time of, to do schools all over the world. And it's really hard to sort of turn them down. And I've been able to kind of parse out, you know, because it's been two, three years, which ones, because I've been speaking to them, which ones are really legit and which ones aren't vanity projects, to be honest. Um, and I see that you're shaking your head. Yes, you've seen this too. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, you know, have a criterion for sort of evaluating them. And then on the other hand, I've get letters and, you know, requests for me to mentor them, to show them how to use their skills um, for community give back. And I think that's actually the thing that's been so surprising to, you know, myself and everyone else is that architecture, you know, can have a very big impact and it's already, having a very large impact on the community in Jaisamir. I mean, there's shifts up about thoughts towards the girls and their daughters and school mm -hmm. and values and all kinds of things. And I, I'm not saying I'm responsible for all of them, but it's sort of, you know, my feeling is, is it's sort of like a, a drop of water um, that kind of ripples and, and an outstretched hand no matter what you're doing can lead to so many things to for these women and girls to know that there are people supporting them well beyond wherever their village is and where they're from is like it just means so much to them and actually Here's my pitch to all people who want to volunteer is every single one of you has something that you can share. And believe me, you, you, you think, oh, well, you know, they're not gonna want it, but the, they just like, they're sponges, they wanna eat it up, they wanna just know and, and learn from you and, and anyone for that matter. But, you know, especially for people who come from someplace far away. So um, let's see. So this has led me to a bunch of kind of crazy endeavors as well. Um, as I said, I really kind of loved all the craftsmen and working with them in stone and wood. 
And I, one of the reasons why I built the building in a modern form was because no one else had. And I wanted them to see that you could um, use these, these forms and their skills to do something that was of, of today. Because all of the younger generations of stonemasons and craftsmen aren't, aren't working anymore or aren't following in their father's, mother's footsteps. So um, the building now is being copied all over um, India, which is fantastic. And um, the, they, I've had many come to me and say, how did I know that this has been a dilemma they've been working on for 30 or 40 years? And I said, because, um, um, or how did I solve it? I said, because I had no idea it even existed. So, you know, um, my complete naivete actually helped. I mean, which is a point towards creativity and doing the research. I actually, my way of doing research is actually to know as little as possible, <laughs> visit the place, talk to the people, and gain knowledge that way, and then come back to the US or wherever and dig in on the points that I need, you know, research. Um, but like, you know, just as an example in Mongolia, we went around, I, I'm there with a paleontologist who's become a really good friend and I'm asking about the weather conditions and how to deal with this building on this, another piece of sand. And um, she said, let's go visit those, um, nomads over there, and I'm like, I can't even see them. They're these little white specks of yurts on the horizon. So lo and behold, we go over there, and um, they knew everything about the weather. I'm on the way, I'm driving with her, and I'm like, I saw a weather station a little bit you know, farther back, and I'm sure they have all the data for the area, and she said no. So we went, <laughs> they, let you 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 can walk into I, I highly endorse anyone going to Mongolia. You can walk into any gear yurt we call them, and first you 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 call out um, keep the dogs inside, and then you say and then you go in and they um, they will serve you food, they will have you stay. And so anyways, we went over and asked for, we spoke to them for, you know, an hour or so about the migratory paths of animals, the, um, the you know, rain, the wind, and all the things we needed to know. So, um, I, you know, if I had studied that from New York, I, you know, it would have taken me, you know, months to come up with that, but this was just one, you know, 30, 40 minute visit. Um, I, I was gonna say that does, that really is that creative process, you know, of gathering data and information and then yeah. using so, it and then bringing it back and saying, is this effective, is this right? Yeah, I mean, the way you described the creative process, I think was really interesting. I was like, oh, that's what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> because, I actually do like to kind of not have preconceived ideas when I visit, yeah. um, mainly because I want to see the architecture. I want to see how their how the communities function, kind of firsthand. And actually, through my work, I mean, I am not a tourist. I am eating in, um, you know. In their homes, uh, I did a project in Nepal. We were sleeping in a monastery on the floor. Um, they're not comfortable trips <laughs> after, because we had just hiked for five days um, with bare, you know, not a lot of food. Um, but anyways, um, yeah, so to actually really dig in and actually get to know from the inside these places, I've done this, uh, Mongolia, I just did it again in um, Morocco. Um, one of our new, uh, future projects is in Zimbabwe, I've yet to go there, but um, the latest thing, I, and- Diana, sorry, I'm gonna actually, I wanna, I don't, I'm worried they're gonna kick us out oh, when we run out of time. No, no, it's great, I, because we could each, we could do an hour with everybody, but I wanna sort of use that as a transition to Mara, if okay. that's all right. Sorry, I don't want, because I know we all wanna hear more and obviously we'll all be able to hang out afterwards. More. I know, I know, but, but I, I just wanted to, I wanted to, um, 
what I think is so interesting, this was not intentional, but you know, Ken's talking about working with the local people and with the local resources to build a, an alcohol brand, right? And you're talking about, in a completely different context, also working with local people and local resources and the land. And that is actually kind of a, a, a transition to I think what Mara is going to talk about, about working with people and resources and environment and land. So I, and that was no way was that an intentional part of this, but it speaks something to what you're doing and maybe where we are as a culture and what we're, how we're thinking about things. But anyway, let's jump on to Mara. Thank you, Diana. So that was insanely interesting, and I'm feeling totally uncreative, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely unworthy. <laughs> Seriously, that was a remarkable story. Um, I am going to show some slides, and I think oh, I yeah, need you your clicker. The, you can stand up and walk up. around. I will, but I thought I'd just open by, by saying, you know, this is just going to be a story about creative approaches to climate change and democracy. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> um, so what to bear in mind before we kind of kick off, and there are some videos as well. So, you know, we think about Australia, the place that's been my home for almost 35 years now, and we think this beautiful country full of kangaroos and koalas and the Great Barrier Reef and majestic forests, and it, it is all of that. Uh, it's also what we call a petrostate. So it's the third largest exporter of fossil fuels following Russia and Saudi Arabia. Huge amount of thermal coal, metallurgical coal, gas, and not stopping that anytime soon. So we've been going through what we call climate wars. Uh, where our federal government, which is a Westminster system, so you're going to have to follow. I'm glad there's a very high IQ in the room. Things are a little bit different there. Uh, there's a Senate and a House of Representatives. There's no president. So the prime minister is chosen by the party that wins the most number of seats to rule the day. There's mandatory voting, right? Very, very different system. Uh, with that kind of a model, we churned through seven prime ministers in 10 years over climate change on both sides of party, right? Both sides of politics. So party would get elected, they'd propose something, they'd have a fight, outside there'd be lobbying, they'd change prime ministers. They'd have another election, they'd switch sides, they'd have a fight. They'd... So we've just gone nowhere on these issues. So I, I just wanted to set the scene uh, I guess starting, and I will stand up because I actually enjoy watching these videos. And uh, it's actually quite creepy up there. We have lots of light in our eyes. Um, uh, so that, that's kind of the portfolio of things that I do now. I sit on a number of commercial boards and nonprofit boards. But the thing I wanted to talk about is that thing on the bottom right hand side. And you see that little circle called McPherson Independent. I live in the Gold Coast in Queensland in the electorate of McPherson, which is one of 50, 151 parliamentary seats in the Australian Federal Parliament. So uh, let, let, let's go ahead and show the first video. I think maybe I do that. And maybe I click again. The sense of emergency in tackling the wildfires simply isn't mirrored by Australia's politics. Scientists say the gravity of the wildfires is directly linked to greenhouse gases making the planet warmer. Yet for nearly a decade, Australia's government has failed to take climate change seriously. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't treasurer. be scared. 2017, and Australia's now Prime Minister Scott Morrison lords carbon-emitting fossil fuels in Parliament, showing zero cognizance of the need for clean energy. Those opposite have an ideological, pathological fear of coal. Even at a major climate conference in Madrid just a few weeks ago, Australian delegates were accused of acting outside the spirit of the Paris Agreement designed to limit global warming. Okay, so that was, uh, I think, filmed around 2019. Um, somewhere in the middle of that 10-year war, in a tiny electorate in the state of Victoria, which is in the southeast of Australia, very conservative, rural electorate, a community started coming together of families and friends noticing that their federal member 
was talking about things like refugees and, you know, very strange ideological challenges, whereas they were really concerned about drought, transport infrastructure, agricultural inputs that were getting very expensive. And they were sort of wondering, will our member actually ever talk about what we're interested in? So they used a model adopted by the Country Women's Association of Victoria, very radical, called Kitchen Table Conversations. And they persisted. They, they went to about 500 uh, just ordinary people that lived in this electorate around people's kitchen tables and asked them the same five questions. What do you love about living here? What are the issues that matter to you? What do you want to see in a representative? Are you happy with how you're represented in parliament? You know, it, it, for your children, what really matters for the future? They collated all of that, wrote a report, sent it to the member who never wrote back. So they said, you know, that doesn't feel very well. They looked amongst themselves and they said, let's run you as our member. And they picked a 51-year-old woman who was an agricultural consultant who knew people because she'd been in their barns. And they got 2,500 volunteers and made up t-shirts. And they didn't call it her party. They called it the Community Independent Project of the Seat of Indi. And she won. She went to Parliament. This is around 2012, 13, I think. She was re-elected for a second term. She decided to retire, went back to the community, and they nominated a second person to represent them, not a political party, a community representative. Meanwhile, one of the prime ministers that got rolled, we gave them to you. He's now on the board of Murdoch's News Limited, a guy called Tony Abbott hugely conservative, very, very far right, in the seat of Manly in Sydney, very wealthy, conservative electorate. They went to Indi and said, how did you guys get a local member for your community and how do we do the same? So a group of women in the seat of Manly had kitchen table conversations, this time with about a thousand people. And then they looked at their demographics and said, who do we want to represent us well? It's got to be someone who's an outstanding professional, a commercial person, because they'll represent that, and hopefully an athlete. So they put an ad in the paper <laughs> looking for a successful business person, hopefully an athlete, and they got a woman called Zali Stegel, who was a commercial lawyer, became a barrister, was an Olympic skier. She beat Tony Abbott out of his seat in Parliament. Okay? So now I'm going to show you a video about what happened when that guy throwing coal around the electorate, Scott Morrison, got re-elected. And a lot of people were very upset because we thought it was going to be a climate change election. I was at the time the president of the National Environment Group. There was a huge amount of campaigning. He was a marketing guy and he did a very good job. He got re-elected. Suffice it to say that this community independent movement started to grow. And a very wealthy man quit the Liberal Party. And here, you, you got to learn some stuff, right? In Australia, the Conservative Party are called the Liberals. And their color is blue. The Progressive Party is called the Labour Party, and their color is red, OK? So this wealthy guy quit the Liberal Party, the Conservative Party, wrote a check for $2 million, set up something called Climate 200, and said, please match my donation if you would like to elect more community independence. There's a playbook in Indi. Go follow it. So let's see what happened in the election of 2022. Independence march into Parliament. The nation has voted for change, and in particular, stronger climate action. I don't think we've ever seen an election like it. A legal spender has taken a large chunk of the vote. In fact, she's ahead on primaries. That looks pretty bad for Dave Sharma. Oh, I'm very calm and relaxed. In fact, I'm increasingly buoyant. Zoe Daniel has defeated Tim Wilson in Goldstein. <laughs> Safe Liberal seat, two-term incumbent. Independence. <laughs> What's happened to the Liberal vote across these so-called teal seats? Look at that, teal, 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 teal. Can anyone even believe this is happening? <laughs> 
The success of community-based independence beat all expectations. You're losing the crown jewels here tonight. Well, it's a teal bath. And uh, I've got a feeling it's going to get worse before it gets worse. Josh Frydenberg has been defeated and Monique Ryan will be the new member for Kooyong. Our climate has changed. Yeah! Hmm. So in our federal election of 2022, we elected nine community independents. And at the moment, the balance of power in the Australian Senate is held by two individuals, one of whom is the only man community independent, a guy called David Pocock, who was the captain of our national rugby team. <laughs> the women that you saw on the screen mostly responded to ads. One is a neurosurgeon. One was our most famous foreign correspondent. One was a McKinsey consultant. One ran a really famous fashion brand. These are not radical people. They are super capable people who were very concerned about climate change. And the reason they called it the teal movement is because, remember, the conservative color is blue. Greens also are part of our, our, our parliament. They're never going to get to a majority, but the greens are a factor like they are in Europe. Blue and green is teal. So this is a movement that's taking from the conservative side with social environmental values. Now, you would have thought that would be an interesting outcome for the environment, in some ways it was. A, a labor government was elected, for better or worse. They did introduce a more active climate policy. They created targets, uh, almost consistent with the Paris Agreement. And then we began to notice, and I'll show you the next slide, that they were just the same in terms of fossil fuels, just under different hats. I think we've approved something like 79 new fossil fuel projects just since the 2022 federal election. We're about to open a huge new gas field in East Timor. We have others in Papua New Guinea on the west coast of Australia. You know, <laughs> we are supporting, as a nation of 25 million people, 18% of the emissions on the planet. Yeah. So we've got to break this thing, right? And so how is that going to happen? Well, we have an election coming up next year. And in my electorate of McPherson, which is the Gold Coast of Southeast Queensland, again, very conservative. We've never had a, you know, a member other than a member of the Liberal Party. Uh, but she resigned. And so about a year ago, a bunch of us got together and said, did you notice that she resigned? And we started imagining what it could look like, and we noticed her primary vote had gone down by 5% two elections ago, another 5% in the last election, and we've been polling, and this is achievable. So we started around my kitchen table. <laughs> There's now 400 of us. We've reached about 380 people. We've written a report about our views. And we've got a brand, we've got a logo, we've got a t-shirt, we're out walking the dogs in our t-shirt, we're doing events in our t-shirt. And uh, just yesterday, we put an ad in our paper. And the ad said, are you the new member for McPherson? There's a whole bunch of volunteers that raised a lot of money to get you elected. We need you to be capable, with strong values, anything but a politician will do. <laughs> that is the story. And I got to launch the actual nominate a candidate page in one of our events, which was just like a total joy. People are nominating their teachers, their principals, you name it. So we'll see what happens. The election is next year. It, it's just another amazing story, and it, I'm reminded of the, the, the traits from the beginning of plasticity, willing to seek all kinds of solutions, divergence, being a nonconformist, but also convergence, bringing that back in and back together and trying to sort of build from the community upward. You know, I, I think that's right. And the thing which was just so evident, you know, the pivot, and we try every which way, like I, I had been fo focused for a long time uh, mobilizing capital 
towards the transition in the form of green bonds, of ethical investing, of you know, advisory work that's impactful. Um, also worked on technology and how to drive new technology down the learning curve. It, it's just that the climate science is very clear, like we don't have a whole lot of time and we need the right policy settings for both those things to work. And we just can't trust the incumbent parties and all the lobbying and the backroom deals when there's this incredible kind of wake-up call. We live in democracies, you guys. We can, act, we can do something about it, right? So I just love that it was these women in Victoria that just figured this out. It's great. It's great. Um, and the way then that was taken forward by other people. And are, are, is, would your prediction be that as more of these folks end up in Parliament, they have a larger voice and more strength? So it is our hope that in the next federal Parliament of Australia, whichever major party gets the majority of seats, there will be what's called a hung Parliament. You see them in Europe, and actually very good policy tends to come out of hung parliaments. They have to negotiate and deliberate so that the balance of power in the lower house, they have to rely on independence to get legislation through. And we're already seeing in the Senate with David Pocock, every time there's a big deal, he can find a way to nudge something in that makes a lot of sense. That's terrific. So we are, we are close to needing to wrap up. I would love to open the floor to a couple questions for any of these three folks, um, but I know there's another event coming in af afterwards and, and the folks are gonna want us to move on. So let's get a question right down here, yeah. Sure, so uh, comments and questions. So quickly, I have a son-in-law from Australia who's in Chicago who's an athlete. So <laughs> what have you brought back from your experiences around the world now to, to the States? And then for you, um, when you started out and, and you're looking to put your product into retail markets, what, what's that process like? How do you get into stores and things like that? So if, just for pe if people didn't hear, I think the question for Diana was, uh, how did your work abroad, how is that fed back into your work here? Yeah. Right, and then a question for Ken about, um, see I was so busy thinking about that question, I forgot the second. How do you bring your product to market? So how do you get into the retail space? <laughs> Great. So, right. And for Ken, how are you bringing your market uh, into, real into retail spaces, into market? So, Diana, why don't you respond first? Um, to be honest, I um, am open to projects in the U.S. I've done some prior to this adventure in India, which is one of the reasons for the springboard to, um, to go to India. I, um, you know, I, I'm doing a lot of volunteer, nonprofit, um, and selfishly, I actually like to go to the other countries because I just learn so much and it's so enriching. And um, I am bringing it back. I mean, I've had, you know, two, three solid years of India and travel. Um, and I am talking to people about bringing it back to the U.S. I live in New York City, so it's cumbersome to get things done there um it, it's it it makes india look easy um so um you know i i like i said i don't look for work work has been just sort of coming to me if there's something here um i would certainly take it on um i mean there is something wonderfully freeing about in working in some of these other countries where you know, the labor and skills are much more plentiful. And as a creative person, that's really appealing. So. Great. The, the spirits business, um, you know, we're dealing with a controlled substance, right, that the government's regulating and taxing. So the, the routes to market are, are pretty clearly defined. So, um, you know, States do things differently, but primarily you have to start with a distributor who's licensed in that state. And so you have to get them to want to carry your product first. And then after you do that, then you have to kind of go around and talk to the retail trade, which we break up into on-premise, which are bars, restaurants, and then off-premise, which are 
liquor stores, grocery stores, those kinds of things. So you're kind of incentivizing. Um, I mean, you're, you're selling, you're convincing, but you're also incentivizing. So sometimes you have to tell the, distrib you know, the guys at the distributor, well, hey, if you do this, we'll give you that. So you're providing incentive dollars. Obviously, you do the same thing um, in the retail sector. So it's just a lot of constant selling. What's interesting is that things are starting to change, so the rules are starting to break down a little bit. So there might be some emerging direct-to-consumer opportunities, and there's some things we can do to make it look like we're selling direct, but it's basically start with a distributor and then to license retailers, and it's pretty cut and dry. Great, great, thank you. Anybody else? Um, yeah, it's straight in the back there, yes. Um, Laura, um, the experiment that you're involved uh, in, is it hot? Possible, sorry, possible for this to happen outside uh, a parliamentary system, uh, for example, here where the parties are so rigid and um, we have a presidential system. You know, I have been thinking so hard about that. I think the answer is yes. You're just going to have to think about it differently, right? It's not. Did, did everybody hear the question? I just want to make sure. Sorry. So the question was, can it happen outside of Australia with different systems of democracy? Could it happen here? And, uh, you know, of course, <laughs> the whole world is watching this American election because, you know, it's a lot more than, than here that gets impacted. The whole Paris Agreement's going to unravel, et cetera. When we think about this model, the, thing, the easy place to go is, you know, I raise my hand, I want to be a politician, I'm going to be the independent, vote for me. And that's not the model. The model is the community does a huge amount of grassroots organizing. It understands who it is and what it cares about, and a huge amount of diversity. In our group, we've got all different kinds of views, but we're concerned about our local environment. We know what matters to us. And then whoever the candidate is, you set it up so they are accountable to the community. So we've got an incorporated body. I'm on the board. We're going to have a selection committee. We're going to be able to sack this person, you know? Like, but we won't need to because they'll know what they're signing up for. They've seen the model work. And I think the place to start is with curiosity. I'm so glad you're curious. If this works, just watch our election next year. If it works, send people over. Find a corner to start with. I don't care if it's the Pacific Northwest or New York or Georgia, wherever it is, right? And you can do it at different levels. There are, you know, very local mayors, we all know that. But having the creativity of working at the federal level and just showing one community what it's like when it's not a party line that's being run in Congress, right? It's the community's perspective and their needs. And the motto that goes across this movement is, we do politics differently. We're respectful. We're educated. We're not argy-bargy, right? Like, you never see these women and David jumping up and down and being idiots. Like, they're just really good people. So I really hope it's possible. It'll be a very different model, but we have to start somewhere. That's, that's terrific. Um, I am, I am aware that there's an event coming in here in a few minutes, so we really should wrap up. Um, I, I want to thank uh, John and Nate, who have been running sound for us and organizing this, for making that all run smoothly. And, and of course, I, I want to thank you for coming to hang out with classmates who do cool things. Um, and I want to thank those classmates, Ken and Diana and Mara, for everything that's so cool. So, and I am sure all three of these people would love to chat more, so if you do have questions, grab them as we, as we uh, depart and let this change over.